Ordeal, a severe experience. Journal, a written account of day-to-day -day events. I am about to tell you a story of an unbelievable adventure. I am not fully aware of how it ended, even though the entire ordeal was the most terrifying experience of my lifetime. My name is Kinsey. I am a retired research assistant. I was formally employed by my trusted old friend, Professor Pierre Aronnax, renowned zoologist and author of Mysteries of the Ocean Depths. Before Professor Aronnax died, he asked me to publish his journal. In this journal, he kept a detailed account of the days we spent on the Nautilus. It is an account that will astound you, a chronicle of the mysteries of the deep. Vibrant colors covered the massive sky above New Orleans. Street lamps were ablaze, and music was heard throughout the town as Mardi Gras flavored the city like no other holiday. People scurried home to prepare for the evening festivities. Others were already out in the town. Strangely enough, there were still those who merely wandered in and out of the niches of buildings like lone sea creatures floating in and out of the underwater caverns that make up the depths of the great blue ocean. In that year of 1877, the professor and I returned from a scientific expedition in the Mojave Desert and arrived in New Orleans just in time for the first Mardi Gras since the horrendous American Civil War. Our desert expedition was an exhausting success. We had classified hundreds of desert roaming species, reptiles, arachnids, etc. I had spent the entire train ride to New Orleans wrestling with a live Gila monster that we acquired for the Paris Museum of Natural History. We arrived at the Marquis Hotel in the early evening made our way in from the busy streets and proceeded to check in. That evening, the parlor of the hotel was humming with anything but the festivities outside. On the contrary, a large gathering of people were discussing the latest rumors about the mysterious sea serpent that had been terrorizing sailing ships all over the world. The first incident occurred three years before. The Manitoba, an international passenger cargo ship, was attacked and sunk in the Indian Ocean. There were no survivors. It was tragic. All of the passengers were lost at sea. Among them, a group of the world's most esteemed scientists, marine biologists, and nautical engineers that comprised the Oceanic Society perished in the collision with the serpent. The Oceanic Society was a brand new organization dedicated to the advancement of ocean research. Professor Aranax was a charter member one of its founders. We were invited to attend the first annual convention that was held on board the Manitoba. I know this sounds strange, but fortunately the professor was gravely ill with whooping cough and was not able to attend. If he had been well, both of us would have perished with the others. It was a terrible shock to the scientific community. All of those brilliant minds lost not to mention the dozens of other civilian passengers who perished as well, people still remembered the shocking details of the catastrophe. The Manitoba was one of the best built ships in the Cyprian line. Its hull was four and a half inches thick. One man shouted. What kind of creature can pierce a hole big enough to sink a ship of that size? Questioned another man. It must be a whale of some sort, a menacing barbaric species waiting to devour us all. Surely no one is safe, shrieked a woman. An older gentleman stood up in the middle of this frenzied crowd. The smoke from his cigar filled the air with a pungent odor that seemed to silence the room. He mentioned two previous incidents of that year involving other ships from different countries that had also come in contact with the same monster. The Corsican spotted the creature shooting water out of its blowhole to the height of 150 feet five miles off the coast of Austria, he said. It was quite obvious that he had his geography mixed up. Professor Aranax decided to join in the commentary and offer his assistance. 
<clears throat> I believe it was Australia, said the professor. That's what I said, Australia, he said assuredly. And was it not three days later that the Vasco da Gama saw the same kind of creature shooting a fountain of water to that same height in the South Pacific? That means that it swam a distance of... He turned to the professor in confusion. 2,100 nautical miles, said the professor. The professor's correct answer gave this man the impetus to conclude his bombastic discourse of the matter. Exactly. 2,100 nautical miles in three days? Three days? Unfathomable. It's impossible. I think the sea monster rumor is just a bunch of wool being pulled over our eyes. I believe that the great industrial revolution has extended below sea level, and we are dealing with an underwater frigate. I have no doubt that it is a strategic military invention created by a vengeful foreign country with enough horsepower to scare the dickens out of law-abiding trade ships all over the world. Either that, or there are two of these confounded whales, said the older man. The professor and I shared a quiet laugh to ourselves. These people were very misinformed. We knew every account of every frigate that came in contact with this monster since the Manitoba incident. We also knew of the fantastic rumors. People had painted pictures of the supposed Leviathan. They were ghastly renditions of lizards gobbling up ships, embarrassing dragon-like creatures, much like the dreaded sea serpents of the 15th century and the Loch Ness Monster. We had more important things to do than to be bothered with this fantasy. However, Professor Aranax felt it was proper to give his opinion of the matter. I urged him not to, for I feared he would be misquoted and remembered as a laughingstock. He felt it was necessary to dispel such rumors for the sake of scientific research and general peace of mind. Forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, for intruding on your forum here. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Pierre Aranax of the Paris Museum of Natural History. This is my assistant, Conseil. I, too, have my views about the mysterious events of this year and would like to share with you the opinions I have formulated, said the professor. The professor explained that the evidence suggested a creature with aggressive ramming tendencies and an appendage with which to impale a steel-plated hull. This appendage was found in a species of whale known as the narwhal. Narwhals, Monodon monoceros, were usually found in Arctic or subarctic waters and had a unicorn-like tusk protruding from the head. People were interested in this explanation, although some were very skeptical. Do narwhals grow to be 350 feet in length? asked one man. The professor pondered before answering this question. We had been working together for 15 years. I knew that his knowledge of the animal kingdom was vast indeed, but that he was not entirely sure if narwhals grew to be that large. The largest one that we had studied was 60 feet, which was large indeed, but not large enough to draw such national notoriety. Though there were exceptions to every rule, mutations, various examples of giantism in every species, the professor did not want to be misunderstood. Technology at that time had only afforded us limited knowledge of the ocean. Modern technology has not advanced so far that we could possibly detect and study all of the different species of animals that inhabit the darkness of the great ocean depths, said the professor. Concerning the Manitoba incident, in that it was indeed struck by something, narwhals are the only species I know of that have the capacity to do such damage, he continued. Really? One man asked. Narwhals have a hard ivory tusk. The Paris Museum has an ordinary narwhal tusk that measures seven feet, four and one half inches long, with a base approximately nineteen inches thick. I believe what we are dealing with is a giant narwhal, possibly five to ten times larger than an ordinary one. A narwhal of these proportions has a corresponding tusk size anywhere from forty-five to seventy feet long with a base approximately ninety-five inches thick. A tusk of this size could successfully pierce a hole large enough to sink the Manitoba and ships much larger as well, said the professor. The man with the cigar looked at the professor with penetrating eyes, as if he were trying to refute his theory with a glance. Professor, what do you think of the possibility of a submarine? He asked. Professor Aranax remained dignified in his answer, despite this man's blatant impudence. 
Although I know nothing about the engineering involved to produce such a machine, it is an interesting concept. It would have to be the work of one individual, since several international ships have been attacked. What individual could invent something so complicated? They would not only have to consider fuel, provisions, and navigation, but oxygen as well. I believe we are dealing with nature, sir, not science or politics, he said. The man with the cigar left in a huff, but the rest of the crowd seemed very satisfied with what the professor said. We bid them goodbye and left. Little did I know that our involvement in this matter had only just begun. The next day we were busy packing our luggage for the boat trip home to France. I was feeding our ravenous Gila monster when there was a knock at the door. When I opened it, a middle-aged man in a naval uniform was standing before me. He was very highly decorated. Professor Aronnax, he said. Whom shall I say is calling, I asked. J.B. Hobson, Secretary of Navy, United States of America, he replied. One moment, I said. Please come in. I introduced Mr. Hobson to the professor and finished feeding the Gila monster. I could tell that the matter was urgent. Uh, professor Aronnax, I am sorry to bother you on such short notice. I'll be brief. I received word that you were in New Orleans and thought you might like to join a landmark scientific expedition on the high seas, being the foremost authority of the underwater animal kingdom. I would rather not bore you with the specific details of Mr. Hobson's visit. In short, word had gotten out of the professor's opinions of the monster in less than 24 hours. Due to his impeccable reputation as an esteemed scientist, we were invited to join a search-and-destroy mission. Commander James Farragut of the Abraham Lincoln would be our host. The United States Navy felt that the professor would be an invaluable asset in finding this animal and helping to destroy it before another catastrophe occurred. The professor graciously accepted the offer, and I had no choice but to go along. I admit I was slightly excited over the classifications of fish we would discover on such a journey as this. All in all, I cannot lie. My heart bent towards France, and I hope this next expedition would be swift in its purpose. Before we departed, we were told that the creature was last seen off the coast of British Columbia. We left the port of New Orleans, sailed out through the Gulf of Mexico, down and around the coast of South America, around Cape Horn, and into the Pacific Ocean. For three months, there was nothing in sight, and I realized that my initial hopes were futile at best. We met several interesting people during this trip. Commander Farragut was an admirable captain. He knew his ship, his crew, and his duty to destroy the giant narwhal at any cost. Commander Farragut even promised a $3,000 reward to the first person to spot the creature. Also on board was Ned Land, a master harpooner from Canada. His weathered countenance told tales of great whaling adventures in the Arctic. It was terribly overcast the first day we met Ned. His stocky frame stood solidly on the poop deck. The crow's feet around his eyes deepened with each minute he squinted out to sea. Why are you squinting? The sun is behind the clouds, the professor asked. I'm squinting in doubt, he said. The sun has nothing to do with it. A rather interesting conversation ensued between them. They shared stories of their separate expeditions and discovered a mutual zeal for knowledge and adventure. However, the two did not agree on the fundamental reason why we were on board the Abraham Lincoln. Ned did not believe in the existence of a giant narwhal. I don't understand, Ned. Surely someone with your knowledge and experience in harpooning multiple species of whale can conceive of a giant narwhal, the professor said. Professor, I'm a whaler. I've killed dozens of species of whales, but never, in all of my years, have I seen a creature that can pierce a hole through a steel ship. Maybe it's a giant octopus, Ned said. That's impossible, Ned, said the professor. Although the octopus has a sharp beak, the mollusk could not move fast enough to make much of an impact. 
No matter how large, it would not be able to sink the Manitoba. We'll see. The ocean is full of surprises. I can tell you that, said Ned. Our last two weeks on board were spent combing the South Pacific, and we were getting increasingly discouraged. I remember thinking perhaps the narwhal had perished, or it was hiding clear across the globe in the Indian Ocean. No one knew. It was evident, however, that a $3,000 reward was not enough to keep everyone's interest piqued. Commander Farragut agreed that it would benefit everyone if we returned home. I was relieved, although I felt bad for the professor. We stood at the ship's bow. I remember it as if it were yesterday. We talked of how much we missed France. Sometimes I rehearse my public apology to the entire world for testifying to the existence of this obvious hoax. I do not owe the world half the apology I owe to you, Conseil. I drag you all over the globe at a moment's notice, and you have not complained once. All for nothing but a wild goose chase, the professor said earnestly. Professor Aranax was too intelligent to delve deeply into feelings of embarrassment. Sometimes he would relate to me a certain disappointment he harbored within. I would always try to make light of the situation. After all, we were great friends. If you would excuse me, professor, the narwhal you have testified to is much larger than a wild goose. You need not apologize. At the time, the matter demanded our immediate decision. After tonight, however, we can direct our thoughts toward home, the museum, and business as usual. How I miss it, I said. Just then, Ned Land cried out from the crow's nest. I can still hear the words ringing in my ears, and I still feel the chill in my bones that followed hard upon. Look, there it is! the ship became a mass of activity. Crew members ran to their positions, and the ship coasted along as it was ordered to stop. What Ned Land saw had the same characteristics that were accounted by passengers on the Corsican and the Vasco da Gama. There was something extra. The giant narwhal glowed like an electric eel. I was taking notes for the professor as he dictated specific details of the narwhal. When he stopped talking, I looked at him. His face went white. I looked out to the creature. It was heading straight for us. Commander Farragut ordered the engines to be reversed, and the Abraham Lincoln began fleeing from the electric narwhal at top speed. When I saw that the creature was gaining on us, I began to panic. The professor always relied on my impenetrable calmness. To tell you the truth, I panicked regularly, but over the years, I built up an amazing front that he never knew. I guess my panic was contagious because Commander Farragut ordered the engines full throttle and the Abraham Lincoln was cruising at 14 knots. We could not outrun the animal. The narwhal circled around us and we were blinded by its electric light. Once my eyesight adjusted, I saw that it had stopped a mile and a half away from the ship. This is unbelievable, one officer cried. The narwhal truly did look like a monster. It was as black as night, its eyes glowed green, and its gargantuan tail swirled in the water, forming ominous waves that threatened everyone who held the dreadful beast in sight. Commander Farragut ordered the crew to immediately prepare for an attack. We were going to fire at close range. Cannons were loaded along the railings of the ship, and Ned Land sharpened his harpoon. The creature was still lurking a mile and a half away from the portside bow. The first mate signaled the rest of the crew to their stations. 
the professor and I held secure positions at the ship's helm next to Commander Farragut. Ned Land, with harpoon in hand, jumped in the longboat on the side of the ship. The creature swam slowly with its fin visible just above the surface. The Abraham Lincoln was cruising slowly behind it when it let out a roar incomparable to most whales and spewed a column of air and water out of its blowhole. I estimated the column to be at least 100 feet high. At that moment, Commander Farragut signaled the cannons as this was an excellent opportunity to strike the creature. Two shots fired within seconds of each other, but nothing seemed to damage the target. Alerted by this sudden attack, the creature swam around to position itself directly in front of the starboard side of the hull. Ned Land stayed secure in his post, waiting to strike the head at the right moment. It increased speed as it came closer. I saw crew members brace themselves as best they could. The professor and I moved to a more secure position away from the helm. At the moment of impact, the ship rocked with such a force that the professor was hurled overboard. Since I followed the professor everywhere, I felt compelled to throw myself overboard as well. We watched as the Abraham Lincoln began its fatal descent into the ocean depths. We were the fortunate ones. I noticed a broken piece of the ship's mizzenmast not far from us. We swam towards it for over an hour, fighting the strong current. The professor was very tired. I was afraid he could not hold out much longer. When we'd reached the mizzenmast, the professor hung on tightly as I began to look for some sort of rescue. I thought perhaps somebody had survived the shipwreck and was floating along somewhere in one of the lifeboats. Through dense fog, I was able to make out something. It did not look like a regular lifeboat. It was more like a tiny island. But that was preposterous. I was quite certain that we were miles away from any landmass, uncharted or not. I saw something moving on this thing. It was a man. I called out to him as best I could, but I was so tired and hungry that I barely made a sound. The professor, exhausted as well, helped me balance myself on my knees on top of the mizzenmast. I kept a handkerchief with me at all times. Even though I was actually Belgian in origin, my handkerchief was red in honor of the French revolutionaries. I waved this wet banner in the hopes that the man would see us. I managed to feebly yell, help! We were spotted. I cannot tell you how grateful we were, not only to be rescued, but to find that our hero was Ned Land. He was thrown overboard in the crash as well. He swam out and dragged us to this tiny island. We came to find that this unidentifiable island was our nemesis, a fully operational submarine designed in the guise of a treacherous sea monster. I instantly remembered the old man in the parlor of the Marquis Hotel. That boob was right. The world was being menaced by the work of man, not nature. Ned discovered the vessel two days prior and was not yet found by the crew. Isn't it amazing, Professor? I haven't seen anyone come up top in two days. Maybe the crew perished in the collision, he said. This is the work of a genius, said the Professor. Well, we'll need a genius to figure out how to sail this thing home, said Ned. Professor Aranax was astonished. He examined every portion of the top of the ship as best he could. This was a landmark creation, the first of its kind. I was equally astonished, though I had an awful feeling stirring inside. It was obvious that the inhabitants of this vessel did not want to be discovered. Why else would they try to destroy every ship at close range? Ned and the professor did not seem to share my worries, and I was getting increasingly anxious. I felt the need to impart some words of wisdom to my companions. I thought the salt water had gotten to their brains. If you don't mind my saying so, I believe we are in grave danger. Perhaps we should leave and take our chances floating to land, I said. I realize it sounded ridiculous at the time, but certain circumstances prompt irrational thoughts. Land? Ned interjected. Are you crazy? 
We'll never make it. This ship is obviously deserted. We just have to find a way to get inside. Before I or the professor could say anything, the hatch opened. Three men, dressed in very strangely designed uniforms, came out. They murmured something to each other and then seized us by the shoulders. The professor and I were too exhausted to fight back. Ned did the best he could to defend himself, but he was struck in the head with a blunt object. He was out cold. We were dragged down into the submarine. Our captors did not identify themselves. They kept shouting to each other in this bizarre language that I had never heard before. Together, the professor and I spoke most of the Romance languages along with some Japanese and some Native American dialects. Ned spoke only English and French, but he merely ranted away using some of the most foul language I have ever heard. He had woken up while they were dragging us down. He must have had a very hard head because he was only out for a few minutes. I wished he was still unconscious because he was not helping the situation at all, and I was quite repulsed by him. We were thrown into a dark, empty cabin, and I heard the door bolted shut behind us. We three were very tired from the ordeal. It was not long until we fell into a deep sleep. I remember the sound the engines made just before I passed out. The ship was diving down. I woke up to the sound of Ned pounding at the door of our cabin. He was back to his usual harangue. As the professor became awake, I rushed over to see how he was. Professor, do you know where we are? I asked him. He was still very drowsy. Yes, Conseil. I remember what has happened. How long have we been sleeping? He asked. I don't know. I hope they bring us some food soon. It has been days since we've eaten. Mr. Land still seems to have the energy to be difficult, I said. Ned, please stop yelling, said the professor, trying to calm Ned down. If we have any chance of surviving this ordeal, you are ruining it. Just calm down and help us figure out a way to communicate with these people. Communicate with them? You heard them, professor. Do you think you can communicate with these barbarians? Look, if they're going to kill us, they're going to have to fight me first. If they plan to keep us cooped up down here, they're going to have to feed us, he yelled. I agreed with Ned. Surely they would either kill us or feed us, or both, of course, not in that order. After 20 minutes, a steward came in with three trays of food. Apparently, someone had heard Ned and wanted to occupy his mouth for a while. Saying nothing, the steward set up a table rather elegantly and left us there to eat. I thought this was very strange and almost feared that the food was poisoned. I abandoned that thought quickly because I was much too hungry to care. The food was delicious. It was well prepared and beautifully presented on the plate. But I could not make out what kinds of fish and vegetables I was eating. Strangely, the fish tasted like veal. I assumed the vegetable to be a legume of some sort. The professor was equally impressed with the meal. Even Ned seemed to enjoy it, although his table manners were simply revolting. When we were finished, the cabin door opened again. The steward removed our plates and gave us some clothes to wear that were similar to his uniform. They were made of an odd fabric. It looked like silk, but its texture was thicker and more insulated. I was baffled. Nothing on this submarine was the way it seemed, not completely anyway. I discussed some of these puzzling aspects with my companions. Professor, where do you think these men come from, I asked. I do not know, Conseil. I couldn't even begin to guess, he said. How about hell? Ned interjected. Be serious, Ned. What I want to know is, who is in command? How did he build such an amazing machine? And why? Said the professor. You forgot, I added. Is he going to kill me and my two companions? I knew that the professor was incredibly intrigued with the submarine. I feared that his fascination would overwhelm him to the point that he would temporarily forget we were prisoners on board, possibly subject to all kinds of cruelty. I began to feel sleepy again. I feared my suspicions were correct and that the food was poisoned. 
but it was not that kind of drowsiness. It was due to a lack of air pressure in the cabin. I looked at the professor and Ned. They had already fallen asleep. Once again, I was at the mercy of something larger than myself, and I had no idea what was in store. This time, I woke up with the smell of fresh sea air. While I was sleeping, the professor had moved me over to an unidentifiable air duct. In the distance, I heard a faint roar, similar to the one I heard on board the Abraham Lincoln. We had surfaced again, and it suddenly occurred to me that the submarine was breathing like a whale. At specific time periods, it surfaced to replenish the oxygen supply. The air was very refreshing. Ned even woke up in an almost cheery mood, despite our predicament. Nothing like a good nap in the middle of the day. Say, Professor, did anything happen while I was asleep? Ned asked. We have surfaced again. The ship is restoring its oxygen supply, said the professor. What's that noise? Asked Ned. It's the submarine releasing excess air and water, said Professor Aranax. You mean this thing has a blowhole? Ned asked. In a manner of speaking, yes, said the professor. While they were talking, I noticed a plaque of some sort on the wall. It had a large N inscribed in the middle and laurels bordering the edges. I began to study it to see if the design showed any evidence of the crew's national origin. I thought perhaps that it was a family crest of some sort. I could only tell that it was made on the ship by one of the crew members, undoubtedly. This did not help us at all. Our cabin door opened. I quickly moved away from the plaque. I hoped it was the steward returning with more food as I was hungry again. When I turned around to face the door, I saw a man I did not recognize. He was very tall and rather handsome. He stood with his feet anchored to the floor and glared at us with the blackest eyes I had ever seen. I assumed he was of Mediterranean descent for he had jet black hair as well. Good afternoon, Professor Pierre Aronnax. Conseil Toulouse and Ned Land, Master Harpooner, he said with a laugh. I realized he must have been laughing at Ned's ridiculous attempt to harpoon a steel-plated submarine. I presume this man to be our captain. He was very poised, and he spoke with a British accent. The professor, Ned, and myself could not imagine how this man knew our names. He must have had somebody listening to us. Gentlemen, you are prisoners on board the Nautilus. By now, you should know just what kind of ship the Nautilus is and what it is capable of. I have decided to keep you alive as reason dictates that you all may be useful to me, especially you, Professor, he said. May I ask what you mean by that, sir? Asked the Professor. No, you may not at this time. As far as your status as prisoners go, you will be moved to private cabins and will be free to study the Nautilus at your leisure. We have an impressive library, many priceless works of art, and ample space for laboratory experiments, he continued as he walked towards Ned. I realize that these activities may not entice you, Mr. Land, but I have no doubt you'll get used to it. What is this? Are we in prison or college? Ned asked angrily. You would be no use to me as a crew member, Mr. Land. You know nothing about the Nautilus, and I'd rather you didn't start learning. If you persist in protesting your good fortune, I can always kill you as an alternative, said the man. I'd like to see you try, said Ned defiantly. I nudged Ned, hoping that he would not test this man any further. I liked Ned, despite his distasteful manners and violent nature. I would have hated to see him killed. Do not cross me, Mr. Land. You will find it in your best interest to accept your present situation, he said. I have decided to invite you all on a hunting expedition. We will be diving again as we are nearing the island of Crespo and should arrive within the hour. 
Until then, you three may dine with me in my quarters. The steward shall show you the way. I'll expect you presently. Excuse me, sir. If you do not mind my asking, how shall we address you? The professor asked. He turned to us before he left the room and said, I am Captain Nemo. You may address me as such. Nemo, I thought. Translated from the Latin, this means no man. I was left speechless from our first visit with the mysterious captain. Captain Nemo's cabin was quite tastefully decorated. Several priceless works of art hung from the walls. There were paintings by Raphael, Velasquez, and Michelangelo. They were beautifully framed around what I imagined was Captain Nemo's prized possession, besides the Nautilus, a huge antique church organ. It was made of mahogany with fabulously etched gold pipes. The dining table was impressively set. Our dinners on the Abraham Lincoln were not half as elegant as this. Captain Nemo called us over to eat another sumptuous meal. We were eager to compliment the chef. This food is delicious, said the professor. How do you prepare the meat? What you are eating is not meat, professor. It has the flavor of veal, but in actuality, it is filet of sea snake, Captain Nemo replied. I thought I might die. Ned kept eating until filet of sea snake registered in his brain. I was grateful to see him slow down. His etiquette was atrocious. And the vegetable is sautéed sea cucumber on a bed of eel grass, continued the captain. The professor loved everything. He was very appreciative of its excellent taste and nutritional value. I could not imagine how they prepare this kind of food, but I supposed I could get used to it. I did not know what to say to poor Ned. As the evening progressed, I found myself rather relaxed and almost enjoyed the captain's company. He was a very dignified, intelligent person. Ned even felt at ease somewhat. He asked about the expedition at Crespo Island. Captain Nemo answered him assuredly. I am sure you will find the expedition to be an unexpected surprise, said he. Now, gentlemen, if you are finished, please follow me to the observation deck. We followed Captain Nemo out of his quarters and up to the bridge. The captain pushed a lever located right beside the helm. A huge window was uncovered that looked out to the world underwater. It was beautiful. I saw a species of fish that I had only read of in books. There were Hippocampus foliatus, Scorpiana volatans, and Platex vespertilio japonicus. Please forgive my formal classifications. These are the proper names for sea dragons, lionfish, and Japanese batfish. They swam around a picturesque underwater landmass. Gentlemen, behold Crespo Island, said the captain. It is quite interesting to see what an island looks like underwater, said the professor. What kind of game do you hunt on Crespo Island? Ned interrupted. And what kind of guns do you use? The answers to all of these questions will be quite clear to you once we begin the expedition. Please follow me to the exit chambers down below and we can begin, he said. As we proceeded to the bottom of the Nautilus, it suddenly occurred to me that Captain Nemo had not given the order to surface the vessel. Excuse me, Captain Nemo, but haven't you forgotten something, I asked. What? he asked sternly. Well, I timidly continued, aren't we going to the surface? Conseil, the island is completely submerged underwater, he said. At this point, it was quite clear to all of us what we were about to do. I'm not going out there, Ned screamed. We'll be killed. Mr. Land, your persistent naivete is getting quite annoying. If you'd rather not join us, you can very well go back to the solitary confinement of your cell. It would not bother me at all, Nemo said. 
Ned would rather have eaten another heaping portion of filet of sea snake than go back to the cell. He complied with the captain's wishes, and we were on our way. The entire process of preparing for the expedition was very uncomfortable. First, the crew helped us into these strange suits made of the thickest rubber. The chest area was lined with heavy copper plates, and we wore rubber flippers on our feet. We were given round metal helmets that screwed into a metal woven collar on the jacket portion of the suit. These helmets had a large glass piece placed over the face that extended to the left and right sides of the helmet. Strapped to us were electrically powered air tanks that pumped oxygen through rubber tubes. These tubes connected the air tanks to the top of our helmet. Thus, we could breathe normally. I could hardly move in my suit. I laughed as I looked at the professor and Ned. We looked rather silly. Crew members brought us to this room that was not far from our original cell. There were five cylindrical glass chambers in this room. One for Captain Nemo, his first mate, the professor, Ned, and myself. We were placed in our chambers one by one. I did not know what was happening since we could only communicate with hand signals. I was standing in my chamber when suddenly I felt water rising outside of my suit. The floor beneath my feet opened like a seam. With help from the propelling vacuum action of the glass cylinder, I shot out of the Nautilus and landed feet first on the ocean floor. As soon as my feet touched the ground, I looked around to check the whereabouts of my friends. I was unaware that the professor had landed directly behind me, and I jumped inside of my suit when I discovered this fact. I found that it was much easier to move in the suit once enveloped in the element for which it was designed. Swimming in the suit was a difficult feat at first. I watched Captain Nemo to figure out a way to get my balance. After a while, it was not so difficult, and I could concentrate on the beauty before me. There were colors I had never seen before. Gentle shades of blue and green were intensified by the sun's rays, which shined through the surface only 30 feet above us. There were so many different species of fish, anemones, corals, and crustaceans, all spirited in color and movement. I felt as if I were a part of an artist's canvas. It was a beautiful living picture of a world no one had ever known. No one except Captain Nemo. Captain Nemo gathered many elements from the sea. Not only those that were edible, but those that would make clothing, weaponry, and a host of other items necessary to sustain life aboard the Nautilus. The professor and I were busy classifying these numerous species of sea life when I felt strong vibrations to the left of me. I saw a large hammerhead shark heading straight for us. The professor grabbed me by the shoulders and threw us both down on the ocean floor. I was not exactly sure if the shark could see us head on because a hammerhead's eyes are separated so far apart. The professor tried to get back up to see if the shark had possibly fled. He was not up for two seconds when he threw himself down over me again. I could not see anything with Professor Aramax laying on top of me, but I was certain that this was the end for us. I had never been attacked by a shark before, but I imagined it to be very painful, especially since the hammerhead was not big enough to swallow the professor and myself whole. I knew there had to be quite a bit of chewing involved. I prayed that it would not be as painful as I had imagined. After a few moments, Captain Nemo pulled me to my feet. I looked and saw the hammerhead's tail wiggling away in the distance. The professor was still alive, and so was I, much to my surprise. When we got back to the Nautilus, Captain Nemo explained to us what had happened. The shark came very close to killing you both, but there are alternative means of defending oneself against the more dangerous creatures of the ocean such as sharks and killer whales, he said. I'd never kill anything for sport, gentlemen. 
And I only take from the ocean what I need. Have you ever been attacked by a shark? Asked Professor Aranax. Of course I have many times. In actuality, sharks often avoid humans. If you are able to lie still and wrap them on the nose with a pole of some sort, chances are you can escape completely unscathed, he said. Well, I do not know about the professor, but I would not say that I triumph from the experience completely unscathed. I believe my nerves have suffered considerably, I said. There is no need to worry, Conseil, said the captain. We have enough supplies to last us at least another three months. We won't need to return to Crespo Island until then. That is unless you did not collect enough specimens for your research, Professor. Thank you, Captain. We have plenty of specimens, said the Professor. What about you, Mr. Land? Did you find our expedition interesting? He asked. Well, I'll tell you something, Captain. This conservationist attitude is all fine and dandy. And the Nautilus is an amazing piece of machinery. I could even get used to this weird food that you insist on serving us. But all that does not matter, said Ned. It doesn't, Mr. Land? Asked Captain Nemo. No. What matters is that you are holding us prisoner against our will, and I am not going to stand for it, Ned yelled. What matters to you has no bearing on my life whatsoever, Mr. Land. One day you will understand. Until then, there is nothing you can do or say to plead your case. Your fate was sealed the day you set foot on board that blasted warship, he said. Nebo's expression went cold. Every detail of his face seemed to turn to stone, except for his eyes that burned black with his stare. I feared for Ned's life. After he made such a statement, defiant as he was, Ned seemed to cower in his stance. After a few moments, Nemo flawlessly composed himself. Now then, gentlemen, let's do try and enjoy ourselves while we are here, he said. Ned's outburst was quickly forgotten. Captain Nemo continued showing us the marvels of the underwater world. Professor Aranax and I were very appreciative of the scientific research we were able to accomplish. It was around this time that the professor began his journal. He planned to write a second volume to Mysteries of the Ocean Depths with the hordes of information we collected. Until the trouble began, I must say that it was a very enjoyable experience. Our next excursion was set for the pearl fisheries of Ceylon, located in the Gulf of Minar in the Indian Ocean. We met the captain in his cabin for a delicious lunch of grilled sturgeon fish and kelp soup. As you can see, I quickly became well adapted to the lifestyle on board the Nautilus. After lunch, we followed the captain into the lounge. He pulled down a beautiful box from one of the bookshelves. It looked like a miniature treasure chest. It was encrusted with priceless jewels, rubies, emeralds, diamonds, and sapphires. It was the most exquisite object I had ever seen, until I saw what was inside. Captain Nemo pulled out a pearl the size of my fist. I had never seen a real pearl of that size. Many disreputable Paris merchants tried to sell counterfeit pearls of that size to unsuspecting tourists. But they were so ridiculously transparent, gigantic glass balls coated with an artificial substance that had the look of real pearl. Nemo's pearl was real, however, and incredibly beautiful. I harvested this pearl myself, said the captain. How large was the oyster, I asked. Not as large as you would think. Some of the smallest oysters in the Menar beds can hold as many as 200 pearls, said the captain. He placed the pearl back inside the jeweled box, and we were off to the top of the Nautilus. There, a dinghy was bolted into the stern of the submarine, available in case of an emergency. In this case, the Menar beds were located in very shallow water, 
so the plan was to dive from the dinghy. Our diving suits were waiting for us on the platform. This time it was much easier to put on my suit. We waited for the captain's final orders before we put our helmets on. I'll go first, he said. Follow me one by one. We put on our helmets and dove backwards off the edge of the dinghy. We did not need to bring lamps because of the close proximity to the surface. Captain Nemo began to pry open the oysters with his knife. We carefully observed him remove the precious pearls. Soon we were able to collect them for ourselves. Captain Nemo's diving suit was a breakthrough invention. In those days, most pearl fishermen could only stay underwater for about five minutes. This was very dangerous because they risked suffering a stroke underwater. We were safe in our diving suits underwater for over an hour. We collected over 200 pearls each and enjoyed ourselves immensely. When we got back to the dinghy, Ned counted the pearls he collected and rambled on about all the things he was going to buy. Like a little boy, he giggled to himself and talked of expensive clothes, trinkets, and big houses on the Canadian coastline. It was a joy to see him so happy. Even Captain Nemo laughed at Ned's fantastic dreams. On our way back to the Nautilus, we were suddenly surrounded by a group of dolphins. These were common dolphins, Delphinus delphis, and were known to be very friendly to humans. Captain Nemo ordered the oarsmen to stop rowing, and as we slowly coasted to a stop, one dolphin balanced himself upright in the water and communicated a high-pitched squeal to Captain Nemo. I was awestruck when I heard the captain talk back to the dolphin. He wants to know if any of you would like to ride on his back, Captain Nemo told us. We would looked at him in astonishment. I knew of some scientists who studied this phenomenon of talking to dolphins, but none had come to a conclusion. You can understand them, Captain? asked the professor. Why, of course I can. I have extensively studied the behavior patterns of the mammal and have discovered that it is simply a matter of distinguishing the whistles and pulse sounds as means of communication or echolocation, said the captain. Fascinating, the professor exclaimed. You see, gentlemen, this particular part of dolphins knows me from my frequent trips to the Gulf of Minar. I cannot tell you how many times they would take turns bow riding the Nautilus. Which one of you will have a go at it? I will, I said. Professor Aranax looked at me in amazement. You, Conseil? I had no idea that you ever wanted to. I rarely interrupted the professor mid-sentence, but this looked like so much fun, I did not want to entertain any second thoughts. Neither did I, Professor. Sometimes I even surprise myself, I said. I stripped out of my diving suit and jumped into the water. I then grabbed onto the dolphin's dorsal fin, and we were off. What an invigorating feeling. We circled around the dinghy once, twice, and on the third turn, he raced off toward the horizon at record speed. The rest of the pod swam with us, leaping in and out of the water. At first I was frightened that perhaps my newfound friend had taken me too far, but that fear subsided quickly. I felt alive and free as the warm sun beat down on my back and the spray from his fins flapping in the water kicked into my face. The dolphin brought me back to the dinghy and I asked Captain Nemo to thank him for me. Ned took a turn next. The dolphin cruised around in the same direction. The other dolphins were flipping in midair, catching fish in their mouths as they leaped. Ned was yelling, Yahoo! as if he were a cowboy, riding his horse across the plains. Professor Aranax declined his turn. He was not as spontaneous as one might think. Captain Nemo thanked the dolphins again, and they left us. As I watched them swim toward the sunset, I realized that I would never forget that day for as long as I lived. It was hard to believe that the succeeding adventures would be as wonderful as the one in the Gulf of Minar. 
but Captain Nemo kept assuring us that the best was yet to come. The terrible monsoon season was looming over the subcontinent of India, and even though that did not affect the Nautilus below the surface, Captain Nemo postponed future excursions into the Arabian Sea and the Persian Gulf to later dates when we would not be disturbed by inclement weather. We have all the time in the world to see such sights, he told us. In lieu of the fact that the horrendous monsoons would deter our further adventures in the Indian Ocean, we turned around and headed back into the South Pacific. Our destination was the Great Barrier Reef. Professor Aranax and I had been to the Barrier Reef once before. We were studying the behavioral patterns of marine invertebrates for the professor's book. Of course, we did not have the luxury of studying the reef up close. We were confined to the portions of the reef that lay only 10 miles from the Australian coastline, and we were only able to study specimens that we could see through the surface or catch with a feeble fishing line. This was a paramount opportunity for us. Although Ned was not interested in the scientific value of such an expedition, he could surely appreciate the beauty of the largest coral formation in the world. It was a natural wonder, formed by dozens of minute polyps that secreted enough limestone to spread the reef over 1,250 miles along the northeastern coast of Australia. The farthest point of the reef was located approximately 150 miles off the coast. At this point, the entire diving process was second nature to me. We shot out of the glass chambers and swam over to the reef. Dozens of black marlin were darting in and out of the cracks and crevices. Their fluid movement was beautiful to watch against the backdrop of the reef that was adorned in beautiful colors of various coral. We observed common blue coral and brown staghorns. Ned was fixated on the pink and purple sea fans that bloomed like flowers. There was bubble coral and blanket anemones, not to mention the species of fish. Cheerful yellow clownfish swam below their anemone. Unicorn tags and angelfish danced between the rows of starfish that were stuck to the reef, trying to extract a tasty morsel of coral. The professor was observing an old wife, Catodon constrictus. It was a fascinating fish to study because it was solely confined to the waters surrounding the Great Barrier Reef. Also, the old wife was the only known species in its family. It was 10 inches in length and had rounded humps on its back. The professor was so enraptured with the old wife that he did not notice a dangerous sea wasp lurking about. I tapped him on his shoulder and pointed to the creature whose sting can be fatal. We slowly moved away and joined the captain and Ned, who had already started back for the Nautilus. After dinner, I slept soundly. I was very tired from our visit to the reef. The captain said that our next stop was going to be the Red Sea. Professor Aranax and I spent the weeks en route to the Red Sea in the laboratory. Our visits with the captain became less frequent, and we were quite busy tending to our experiments. I had not seen Ned for a few days and took the opportunity to see what he had been doing with himself. Both the professor and I expressed concern that Ned was sitting idle, feeling useless. That is an awful feeling. I remember the day I went to visit him in his cabin and was surprised to see him hard at work. He was scribbling down coordinates, latitude, longitude, northeast, southwest, etc. I had no idea what it all meant. When I asked him what he was doing, he told me that he had stolen some maps and charts from the captain's cabin when Nemo was elsewhere. Do you have any idea how dangerous that is, I asked him. How else are we supposed to find out exactly where we are? He asked. If I can locate our position in the ocean by using the information on Nemo's map, then I'll be able to tell where we are in relation to a civilized country, he said. 
Why don't you just ask Captain Nemo? I asked him. I don't think you understand, Kunsei. I'm going to escape, he said. Escape, I yelled. Ned's eyes nearly bulged out of his head. Shh! How can you escape a submarine? It's impossible, I said quietly. I don't have time to explain. I can't take this anymore. It's been an interesting few months, but I can't stay on this thing forever. And I really don't think our good captain has any intentions of setting us free, he said emphatically. But what about the professor and I, I asked. I'll miss you, he said sarcastically. How can you escape a submarine? It's impossible, I said quietly. I don't have time to explain. I can't take this anymore. It's been an interesting few months, but I can't stay on this thing forever. And I really don't think our good captain has any intentions of setting us free, he said emphatically. But what about the professor and I, I asked. I'll miss you, he said sarcastically. Ned was right. I needed my freedom like any other person. The professor and I had our lives to live back in France. It was highly possible that we'd never resume them again. I chose not to think about it. This was Ned's problem. Don't you think the captain will notice his maps are missing, I asked. I overheard that he is with the professor looking over your latest experiment in the lab. You can help me put these back before he returns, he said. Me? Oh, no. I'm not getting involved. We are bound to get caught, I said. I need you to be the lookout while I put the maps back. Please help me, Kunsei. You don't want to stay in this thing forever, do you? He asked expectantly. I wanted to help Ned, but I had to support the professor. Nemo admired the professor's work and considered him an esteemed colleague. Professor Aranax had a profound influence on the captain. Ned, the professor and the captain have become rather friendly in the past two weeks. In spite of what you may think, I know that our freedom is tantamount to all other concerns. The professor will find a way to convince Nemo to set us free. In the meantime, I believe that he's trying to make it easier for us while we are here, I said. Okay, I won't do anything until further notice. In the meantime, I have to get these back before Nemo discovers they're missing, he said. Ned looked at me so helplessly, and I couldn't refuse. Oh, all right, I said. Let's go quickly. We slowly crept up the stairs to Nemo's cabin. Ned had the charts and maps hidden under his shirt. I was nervous. I was certain that somebody would catch us. I stood outside the door and watched out for anyone coming around the corner. Suddenly, Ned pulled me inside the cabin. I did not know what was happening. He locked the door behind us and walked over to a switch on the wall that I had never noticed before. Take a look at this, Ned whispered. He flipped the switch to reveal a circular window, identical to the one on the bridge. When I looked through the glass this time, I did not see a beautiful picture of fish swimming around in their natural habitat. Instead, I saw a gruesome picture of sharks swimming in and out of the carcass of a ship that had been sunk. I shuddered to think of what they still might be eating. My heart sank as I saw the name of the ship still clearly visible just above the mangled hull. It was the Manitoba. Ned and I sneaked out of Nemo's cabin with ease. We ran to the lab to tell the professor about the shipwreck. The professor was writing in his journal when we rushed in and locked the door behind us. Professor, where's Nemo? Ned asked quickly. The captain left a few minutes ago. He went back to his cabin, said the professor. I trembled for a moment. What if he saw us, I thought. We were very careful as we crept out of the cabin. I was quite certain we would have seen the captain. Did he say why he was going back to his cabin, I asked? No, said the professor. It was rather strange. I was showing him the digestive tract of a common spider crab when he suddenly looked at his watch and said he needed to excuse himself. He said he would return shortly. Ned and I looked at each other in haste. Why? What is it? asked the professor. You both look like you've seen a ghost. I began to describe the sight of the wreckage. With each horrid detail, I became more and more filled with seething anger. 
Professor, the size of that hole was larger than anyone had described. Think of the people that died, the women, the children, our colleagues. This man is bent on destruction. We have to do something before he strikes another ship, I said. This is most unfortunate. What can we do? Asked the professor. Ned told the professor about the maps and charts that he had stolen. At first, the professor was furious with Ned for risking our safety on board, but he soon realized that Ned's foolish antics served a greater purpose. We left the barrier reef three weeks ago. According to my coordinates, we should be back in the Indian Ocean. We need to think of a plan fast, Ned said. Well, mutiny is out of the question, said the professor. The crew is too loyal to the captain, and besides that, none of us know how to run the Nautilus. We'll have to escape somehow. We can use the dinghy, I said. Good thinking, Ned said with pride. If only we could manage to get to the Mediterranean Sea. It's our only chance to get to a civilized country. The Red Sea is a dead end. There's no way to get to the Mediterranean unless we sail around Africa. Ned was right. At that time, the Suez Canal did not exist. Suddenly, the professor's face took on an enlightened look. Wait, Ned. Nemo told me of a tunnel he discovered some time ago. It's a secret underground water passage that connects the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. I am certain that he will show it to us. He said, the Arabian Tunnel Professor. I remember the captain talking about it, I added. We decided to keep our escape plans quiet until we reached the Red Sea. We did not do any diving on our excursion through the historic Red Sea, but we encountered many interesting sights from the observatory window. We observed the lost city of Abu. As the Nautilus got closer, we saw ancient ruins of Islamic mosques and minarets. I wondered about the many people that once lived in such a secure place, seemingly free from harm and strife. It made me think of one's frailty on earth, and I marvel that Captain Nemo had somehow conquered this feeble condition of humanity. Yet he still used his Nautilus as a tool for disaster. Why, I thought. I stopped pondering in fear that my queried countenance would reveal my judgmental thoughts. Along the way we observed a massive sponge colony. I was always fascinated by sponges. They are amazing animals. We were able to get close enough to observe a brand new sponge in its larval stage, dividing its way to the ocean floor. At that point, it would reach the adult stage and commune with the rest of the sponge colony that included so many beautifully shaped sponges. These ocean sponges varied in color and shape and had very interesting names as well. We observed a sheep's wool sponge, an elephant ear sponge, a glass rope sponge, and my personal favorite, Venus's flower basket. They gracefully anchored themselves to the ocean floor, billowing in vivid colors of blue, red, purple, and yellow. The professor and I collected various specimens of freshwater sponges from the Missouri River, but these were only green in color because they consumed great amounts of algae found in lakes and rivers. The professor took notes on a particular sponge that had been severed and was beginning to regenerate. This miraculous process allowed the animal to redevelop the parts it had lost. The professor and I were so transfixed by this magnificent sponge colony that we did not notice the engines of the Nautilus had stopped. Captain Nemo discovered the Arabian Tunnel on his first journey to the Red Sea. Sadly enough, Ned did not come out of his cabin to witness the Nautilus pass through the tunnel. It was a thrilling experience for myself and the professor. The Nautilus dove to a depth of 35 feet. The captain ordered the engines be slowed down to counteract the force of water that flows through the tunnel at great speed. We followed along the base of the land that joined with the Isthmus of Suez. Captain Nemo took the helm and found the black hole that was the Arabian Tunnel. He steered into the tunnel, 
the force of the water allowed us to pass through in less than 20 minutes. My hopes soared to new heights as we entered the Mediterranean Sea. Captain Nemo sent for Ned. When he arrived, the captain told us that we were about to go on a special expedition. He did not say much about it. He merely told us to meet him on the bridge the next morning. Ned, Professor Aranax, and myself met in Ned's cabin to plan how the escape was going to take place. When will we surface again? Ned asked. I suppose in a few days, said the professor. At least not until after we are finished with this special expedition. Good. Maybe we'll be closer to Italy or France by then, said Ned. My heart leapt at Ned's utterance of home. We have to act fast. I say we should get some provisions together tonight, so all we have to do is throw them in the dinghy and we'll be off, Ned continued. How are we going to get to the top platform without anyone noticing us, I asked. I'll create a diversion somehow, then you and the professor can get up to the dinghy and start loosening the bolts. If all goes well, I won't be too far behind, said Ned. Hmm, this is a very risky plan, said the professor with a nervous tone. I guess we have no alternative. Ned said he would give us a signal when to head up to the dinghy the next time we surfaced. I could not sleep that night. I sat up worrying about this special expedition the captain had planned. I prayed that it would not ruin our plans. The Nautilus cruised slowly through the Mediterranean. There were no signs of surfacing for some time, and I longed to see land, especially if it was France. We headed for the glass chambers with our helmets in hand. Before we entered, the captain told us to respect the sanctity of this particular voyage more than any other we had ever experienced. He then put on his helmet and entered the chamber reserved for him. As we left the Nautilus this time, I felt a strange aura around the place we were entering. The captain did not tell us where we were in relation to any land but I assumed we were close to either Turkey or Egypt because we had only left the Red Sea the day before. We maintained 35 to 40 feet below sea level. A chilling stream ran through this particular spot. It felt like a cold front. There were not many interesting species of fish, invertebrates, or even plant life. The entire region was almost barren, except for a few bottom dwellers some brown rays, and a few eels. We followed the captain to a clearing, bordered by some trees and a few delicate vines of plumularia that looked as though they were strategically placed there. We saw three mounds in the otherwise smooth, sandy ocean bottom. When the captain knelt down before these mounds, I realized what he meant by the sanctity of the expedition. This was a graveyard. Ned and the professor stood with me observing the poor captain. I assumed these were beloved crew members that had passed away. The captain met us in the library after we had returned from the underwater cemetery. It was customary for the captain to meet with us after an expedition and discuss our observations and conclusions. I was not prepared for the captain's opening statement. I know about your escape plans, said the captain. It was silly for any of us to play dumb, although Ned made a noble attempt. What are you talking about, Captain? He asked. Ned, please do not insult my intelligence, he said. I know you stole my maps and charts. I saw you and Conseil sneaking into my cabin to return them. You all must understand that you cannot escape for reasons unknown to you until now, and regretfully, I have to kill you. But, Captain... Please don't grovel, Professor. I was afraid this might happen. I cannot risk being exposed to earthbound society, he said. Ned was incensed. He lunged at the captain with both hands, but Nemo, with the strength of an ox, grabbed both of his arms and threw him to the floor. Fighting won't do you any good, Mr. Land. As I said before, your fate was sealed the day you boarded the Abraham Lincoln. 
I have let you live under my conditions. Now you all have betrayed me, and I have no choice but to kill you, he said. I am sorry, Professor. I thought we had an understanding this time. Apparently, you have a short memory. Something strange had happened. The professor looked puzzled. I was curious to know what Nemo meant by the professor's short memory. In any event, I was most shocked by the fact that the professor, who maintained a flawlessly even temper all the time I had known him, roared at the captain in a calamitous fury. This is outrageous! You have to answer for the Manitoba, Captain. I realize you were defending yourself against the Abraham Lincoln, but you murdered all of those innocent people, not to mention half of the world's greatest scientific community, for your own sick reasons, he shouted. Who gave you the right to sit in judgment of everyone? Nemo's face quickly grew pale, and he clenched his fists in his rage. He was livid. It was very frightening to watch. I can remember thinking that if his skin was transparent, we may very well have been able to see his blood boiling. He stammered out a few inaudible words under his breath, as if he were talking to some invisible entity. Fools, you don't know anything. Were you on board the Manitoba, Professor? No, I believe you were too sick to join the rest of your colleagues. You weren't enslaved and forced to use the fruits of your genius as a tool for destruction. You did not lose your wife and children as a result, he said, pointing to the graveyard still visible in the observatory window. Think, Professor, you are just as judgmental as I am, as is every human being who walks the wretched earth. Nemo turned away from us. With tears in his eyes, he stared blankly out the window. The professor's face lost its tense expression. He looked at the captain in awe. I understand, said the professor. The room was silent for what seemed an eternity. The truth was quite clear to the professor, although Ned and I found everything a trifle difficult to understand. Will someone tell me what's going on, said Ned. Before the professor could say anything, the Nautilus hit something. It felt like we had run aground underwater. The engines had stopped. Within seconds, the Nautilus began rocking and jerking downward. What's happening? Yelled the professor. We ran to the bridge. Pipes were bursting everywhere. Ned grabbed the periscope to check the surface. We thought perhaps the ship had been swept up in a maelstrom or tidal wave. Nemo quickly grabbed the periscope from Ned and pushed him across the bridge. Take him away, Nemo bellowed. Two stewards grabbed Ned and held him down while the Nautilus still rocked out of control. Nemo determined that the surface was clear. There was no storm, but something had grabbed us underwater. I looked out of the observatory window once again, but it was pitch black. The window was blocked by something. As I looked toward the window a second time, I recognized one of the ten tentacles of a giant squid. We were cruising around remote underwater caves in the Mediterranean Sea. These were the popular hiding places of most giant squid. Legendary tales of these huge mollusks told of ships tangled in tentacles and wrestled to the ocean floor. This particular squid had lodged his tentacles in the propeller at the stern of the ship. We had to fight him off before the Nautilus sank any deeper. Captain Nemo and his crew grabbed several hand axes. What are you going to do, Captain, I asked. The only thing we can do is drag the squid to the surface and cut it loose from the Nautilus, he said. As Captain Nemo gave the order to surface the Nautilus, several crew members and the captain crept their way to the hatch. Captain Nemo warned everyone to be cautious of the first tentacle to come sweeping into the sub. He lunged at the squid's long, vile tentacle with enough force to clear it from the passageway. Several crew members followed the captain out to the top platform. The professor and I stayed close behind. What a horrible sight! Crew members were snatched up by the tentacles and thrown into the ocean or swallowed up into the squid's giant mouth. I looked in horror at the ugly beak and coarse tongue that formed a horrible orifice a grotesque departure for its helpless victims. 
I had just turned my eyes away when I heard a familiar voice crying out in anguish. It was the captain. He was constricted in one of the tentacles and slowly being pulled toward the squid's hungry jaws. There was nothing we could do for him. Suddenly, Ned leapt onto the platform with his harpoon. I thought surely he had lost it in the shipwreck. He struck the squid between the eyes and released Captain Nemo from its evil grasp. We watched as the hideous creature writhed into the ocean. Captain Nemo was badly hurt. He was bleeding from several lacerations caused by the squid's rough tentacles. He needed medical attention right away, for he was losing consciousness. Ned carried him down into the sub. The professor applied a natural liniment extracted from various seaweed plants that acted as a disinfectant. He also placed a tourniquet on the captain's upper thigh to check the blood flow. Half of the crew was gone, and the Nautilus was gravely damaged. Mr. Land, muttered the captain with great difficulty. It was foolish of you to save my life. You would have been free to escape. You had the chance to see me destroyed, and you were too weak to take that chance. I could not believe my ears. How ungrateful, I thought. Ned risked his life to save the captain, and the only thanks he got was to be called a fool. Ned looked dejected, and I felt sorry for him. I assure you, Captain, it will never happen again, said Ned bitterly. The captain lay suffering on the floor of the bridge. I noticed his pupils dilating and the color draining out of his face. The professor took his pulse. He shook his head as he looked at me. He's dying, the professor said. The captain tried to hold his head up to address us for the last time. In spite of what he promised, Ned took off his shirt rolled it into a ball, and placed it under the captain's head to comfort him. I was once a renowned scientist, like yourself, Professor, he said. I know, Captain. You were a member of the Oceanic Society, said the Professor. I planned to introduce my Nautilus at the convention as an underwater research center, he said, gasping for air. Word of my creation was leaked to a corrupt intelligence faction of my former country's government. They disguised themselves as terrorists. Like common pirates, they sacked the Manitoba and took myself and my research team as loot, leaving the rest of the passengers to die. My wife and two children were on that ship, gentlemen. I lost them all. The mystery was finally unraveled. Captain Nemo and his research team were taken to the island of Sumatra and were forced to build an entire fleet of submarines like the Nautilus. This evil intelligence organization planned to use the fleet as a strategic military device in a bloody coastal invasion of undeveloped territories. They wanted to take over dominion of the ocean. Imagine that, gentlemen. They thought they could rule the seas as they did the earth. With their symbols of military prowess, those ridiculous warships, so fragile in reality, he said. The captain suffered from dementia as a result of his head wounds. He would waver from deranged laughter to heaving sobs they tested the first Nautilus after a year of hard labor. We were in chains and were rarely fed anything but bread and water. When the prototype was finished, I informed them of a red switch that submerged the vessel. They did not know that it was really a self-destructive device on the bridge. After the explosion, I built the second Nautilus as my sanctuary. My research team became my crew, and together we vowed never to return to humanity, to civilization as we once knew it. 
They were responsible. Captain Nemo's hands were cold. I watched the life slowly leave his body. It was very sad. This man had known so much sorrow. Unfortunately, his sorrow was never consoled, and the world lost a true genius. It was over. We were granted clemency after one year of imprisonment, 20,000 leagues under the sea. We filled the dinghy with provisions and rowed until we reached land. We boarded a fishing boat on the Isle of Crete that was en route to Italy. From there we traveled by train to France. I cannot tell you how grateful I was to be on land again. We said goodbye to Ned in Paris. He was returning to Canada the following day and I begged him to keep in touch, but somehow I knew he wouldn't. I still think of Ned often. He was a rare individual whose genuine valor I would never know the likes of again. Professor Aranax and I reported our adventures aboard the Nautilus, but since there were no more incidents after we were captured, the entire ordeal was quickly forgotten. People assumed that the Nautilus exploded in some underwater cave or that it was swallowed by an even larger sea monster than the giant narwhal. Some people even questioned the integrity of our statements, saying that we conjured up the whole story in hopes of gaining international scientific acclaim. As for Captain Nemo, he became a kind of folk hero. People wrote stories about him, depicting him as a contemporary god of the seas, like Poseidon or Neptune. The professor and I decided to keep our story to ourselves until the time was right. Just before he died, the professor gave me the journal that so vividly captured the truth of what happened, along with our conclusions that carried far more weight than those of the general public. We have always believed that the Nautilus still exists. One of the crew members may have become the second Captain Nemo, and he still wanders the ocean floor, uncovering the real mysteries of the ocean depths you see, for many years after our escape, breakthrough scientific findings, never before known to society, would mysteriously arrive at the Paris Museum. Perhaps they are what the captain left us. As for me, I rarely stumble into strange adventures anymore. But every once in a while, when I am vacationing by the sea, I think I hear a faint roar in the distance. It frightens me at first, but then I realize that it is only a part of my past. Maybe I shall see the Nautilus again someday. One never knows.
correct. 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 Sorry, that is not the right answer. Sorry, that is not the right answer. Correct. Correct. Sorry, that is not the right answer. Correct. Correct. Sorry, that is not the right answer. Correct. Sorry, that is not the right answer. Correct. Correct.